So welcome, welcome to the annual Don't Be Scared, Myths and Realities of Small Business Financing. Financing continues to be one of the top five reasons every year why most small businesses don't succeed. They either start out undercapitalized or make poor decisions about money. And then because they've made poor decisions, they're not eligible for financing. So, but I want to let you know that in addition to this event, we offer workshops on a regular basis. You can find a list of all of our workshops here, calendar.gsu.edu forward slash launch GSU. These are our objectives for today. I want these ladies to provide insight into the truth about loans. So many people get into trouble because they just don't have accurate information. They're going to share the basics about the things that you need to know. We're going to dispel some myths and misinformation along the way. And most importantly, I wanted you to hear the facts from the source. Yes, your brother, your cousin, your father may have gotten a loan, but that was their experience. Your experience could be very, very different. And it's important that you seek information from the source, whether it's financing or any other professional matter. Um, the Internet is phenomenal, but seek information from the source. That's a good practice to begin getting into. And last but not least, I want you to hear insights into things that can provide an advantage. They're going to share things that you can be doing right now as a college student, whether you're 12 months, 24 months, or a few years from applying for financing. They're going to give you tips that you can do now that will give you an advantage going forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, um, two, again, of my most favorite people on the whole wide planet, Ms. Tamika Stafford and Ms. Monica Williams. We'll start with Ms. Stafford. Ms. Stafford is the Community Business Development Chair at Truist Bank, formerly BB&T. Her co-panelist is Ms. Monica Williams. Monica is an experienced banking professional with over 13 years in the industry. So these ladies have been doing this a very long time. Without further ado, we are going to jump right in. I have prepared some questions for these ladies. And then, again, I want you, if you have some questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. But just to kind of get things kicked off, and I would love for both of you to answer this, if you could just tell us a little bit about the different the differences between the institutions that you you represent. Tamika, tell us a little bit about Truist Bank and um, the range of business lending that you do. And then the same thing for you, Monica. Sure. Sure, I'll be happy to. And hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you this afternoon. We adore Erica and Monica and I. We're just sisters in the industry, just different companies. Um, but bb and and actually SunTrust Bank have merged to form Truist, just to give you some background. So we were both super regional banks. Um, we're still a super regional bank with the scope extending as far north as Jersey, as far south as Florida, and as far west as Texas. Um, so that's pretty much what that footprint looks like. When it comes to lending, the space that I typically work with and the businesses I deal with typically have lending needs that are a million dollars and below. Um, the bank has the capacity to help you to whatever limit that you want to borrow. I mean, with 75 million, 500 million publicly traded companies, we have that capacity. Of course, you're not at that point yet, but one day you will be. But for now, when it comes to startups and the smaller type loan requests that people have, we can help with that too. We just have specialists that work with you regardless of what space you're in. And I guess I'll jump in. Um, thank you for having me, Erica. Um, hi, Tamika, good to see you again. And hello to everybody um, on the conference call. As she mentioned, my name is Monica Williams and I'm a business development officer with Citizens Trust Bank. Um, CTB is Atlanta born and bred. So we're a community bank. We are a black owned bank here in Atlanta. Um, we have about eight branches around the Metro city and then a couple of branches in Alabama. So uh, much smaller than a Truist or, you know, other regional banks. We primarily work with um, the Southeast corridor, Alabama, Georgia, and then the contiguous states. Um, We've been around for 100 years almost. So next year we'll celebrate our 100 year anniversary. So that's something that we're super duper proud of. Happy to be in Atlanta providing small loans to um, small business loans to uh, the community. And uh, we work with uh, loans from 
$50,000 up to as much as $8 million. So for me particularly, I usually stay around the $100,000 to $500,000 range. Um, but I have worked on deals that are larger. So far to date, the largest one I've done is about a million. Um, so CTB has been a really great space for me has given me the opportunity to learn a lot of different things. Um, so some of the folks there really jump in and help if there's opportunities um, for other larger opportunities for me. And then it's also a space where I could help with small businesses who are just getting started, giving them advice and counsel and different things like that to kind of help them grow. Well, thank you, Monica. And that kind of leads me into my first question. What you mentioned, the different, you know, types of lending that you have done, is there a particular type of business that you like to work with or that the bank really enjoys working with? Yeah, so um, our bank particularly does a lot of church lending. It's not something that some other larger banks do. We have a really nice size portfolio of religious organizations. Um, we also have a large hospitality portfolio. Um, that's that comprises and then a real estate investment. We do a lot of that as well. But recently I found myself working with some really exploding female black owned businesses. So that's been really, really joyful for me to just see how, you know, they've taken an idea in their kitchens. Um, for instance, I work with Honey Pot, the feminine hygiene company, you know, just take an idea and just building it into a multi-million dollar brand. Um, small world. We actually had Honey Pot. She did a presentation for E&I. Uh, Tamika, yes. I'd love to throw the same question out to you. What types of businesses does Truist Bank, formerly bb and like to work with? And is there a trend to the type of businesses that you see get approved or that's attracted to you, your sweet spot, if you will? And so, actually, it's, that's why it's good that we have two different banks on this call because each bank is going to have a different appetite for different things. So, for some of the things that Monica just mentioned, those are some of those are not actually our sweet spots. So, and I'll tell you some of the things that are. So, while we love churches, what we found is that a lot of churches don't. We have certain criteria that they may not meet. In fact, we prefer deals to CTV because we sure. wouldn't be able to, to help them. Um, and that's, I think, the key when you're dealing with a bank is if they can help you, at least they know someone in the industry that can, because ultimately you want to make sure that the client gets what they need, right? So if we're not the person to furnish that. We need to know who can provide that service. So she mentioned churches and she mentioned um, invest in, investment um commercial investment property. I think that's what she said. And see, it just depends on the, the market. With COVID, that changed a few things for us. Um, we, it depends on the situation for commercial investment property. So that one will be case by case. But things that we love, um, we love manufacturing, we love the medical field, um, we love anything. Technology is, is, is good. We like the, the, the trends for technology. It's just making sure that a person is well leveraged um, or not over leveraged rather. We enjoy, um, we put a, a finger in the pulse of the, the market really. So therefore with COVID that's made some industries more volatile clearly right. than others. So while we may have loved daycare centers, um, that has been hard hit by COVID, right? And so therefore it's affected their ability to repay. So that will change with the market. So. The key, which I know may seem like it's not a direct answer, but it really still is, and I'm not trying to dip into one of your questions, it relates to the relationship with the banker, because as long as you know the person that you're dealing with, they can tell you where the trends are falling, what it sounds like, are we looking like we're tightening up, are we looking like we're relaxing our terms? We typically try to meet people where they are holistically, um, because we don't take a cookie cutter to say no churches, no this. We like to look at your situation first to see if there's a way we can make it work. So. There are very few things, unless it hits our restricted list, and we'll talk about that, I know, later. But unless it hits our restricted list, we're going to try and make it work. And if we can't, then we'll refer you to someone who can. Yes, ma'am. You already know you've done this long enough. The next question is the restricted list. What businesses <laughs> are a no-no? So some of the businesses and industries that we don't lend to, now that doesn't mean we won't still offer other banking services, but when it comes to lending, there are certain categories that we just are not comfortable with, and some of them are pawn shops. Um, 
adult nightclubs, adult entertainment, um, armed security personnel contractors, payday lenders, um, check cashers, buy here, pay here, auto um, dealerships. We've had like auto brokers where they, they broker deals for cars, but they don't have any cars. Um, so it's kind of like, well, then, you know, why do you need a loan? Um, so therefore, then we get into that though. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't have any inventory. You don't hold any inventory. Um, yeah. Consumer credit counseling services, um, for those and oil field services, especially from an environmental standpoint, those are just some of the ones that we strictly don't lend to. And those, what happens is we'll tell you from the front end, we won't let you go through a whole underwriting process and then disappoint you a week, 30 days, 60 days later. We'll tell you on the front end if it falls in that category, this is not something that we lend to. So therefore you can make an informed decision quickly. I mean, we hate to give you a no, but at least a fast no is better than a slow no. And absolutely, because this process is not a fast process to begin with. So I'm sure people greatly, greatly appreciate that. So Ms. Monica, what about at CTB? What is it? that you don't necessarily have an appetite for or would not be a good referral for. Right. Yep. So some of the same industries that Tamika in, uh, mentioned for sure, um, the adult or gentlemen's club, nightclubs in general, um, cash intensive businesses like um, C stores. Sometimes we will do a, a, a convenience store or gas station, but it ha it's a case by case scenario. It's generally something that we like to stay away from. Um, yeah, I think that that pretty much her list plus those couple of things are okay. things that we tend to stay away from. That's one area that you are similar. <laughs> yes, um, ma'am. Mm -hmm. College students, everyone on the call are is a college student, either undergrad or graduate. Um, have you, have either one of you ever financed a college student for business with a business loan? I can't think of one offhand, but I do, that doesn't mean that they don't qualify. For instance, college students look different. College students may be 19 or 20, but college students, I'm in GS, I'm actually enrolled in GSU right now myself, and I'm not 18. So therefore, <laughs> college students all look different. They're all different mm -hmm. ages. I have a full-time job. So therefore, what we look at is what qualifies you. And it's not so much the fact that you're in school, it's where your cash flow is coming from. We need to know that you have the ability to repay. And if you have income that is consistent income, not, and not student loan income, we don't count that. But because um, that's designed for your school, you know, fees and expenses, which we anyway, we won't even go there today. But that's what that's designed for. Um, <laughs> if you have other stable income sources, such as a, a daytime job, you have rental property. Everybody's situation is different. Not all students don't have things. Students right. nowadays have other assets and, ac and, and access to funds. The key is your ability to repay. That's what we look for. So with that in mind, one of the biggest issues and challenges with being in college is, of course, credit. Many students, and you've got two sides to that fence, many students just don't have access to credit. Then there's the other side, like, I, well, I won't put anybody else on blast except myself when I was in college. There were a lot of people that were giving out credit cards. If you were breathing, you could get a credit card, which was one of the fastest ways to mess up your credit. What role does credit play with the lending decision? So credit is critical, especially now, because these are the years and when you're forming your, cre your credit history. So your student loans are gonna generate some credit history for you, but not really, if you have any. Hopefully you don't, but if you do, um, it's gonna help create a trade line on your profile, but it's not going to really count toward that because you're not repaying yet, you're in deferment. So that really doesn't really count for you yet. So it's critical to have some of the type of trade lines out there that help, but to, um, to Erica's point, it's not just having the trade lines, it's how you manage them. And I know when I, I was young and I, I'm, a, I'm a shopper now, I love to shop and I, I struggle with that um, still. But then, but I understand the value and prioritization far better now than I ever did. And I think that's a key for you as young people. Think in terms of, of the long term, right? What you're trying to accomplish, not the here and now, not what you want right now, but what you're trying to achieve. So when you do get that credit, Ideally, try to make sure it's something that you can pay off that month, if at all possible. And if not, let it be something that you can still manage where you're not overextending yourself from a utilization standpoint. And I know Erica has gone over that with y'all, or we'll maybe talk about it today. And if you have a hard time getting credit, some people say, well, how can I get credit if nobody gives it to me? I don't have history. 
you tell me, you deny me because you say, well, you don't have credit history, but you won't help me get any. Um, <laughs> the key to that is to have someone allow you to be an authorized user on their account if possible. Mom, dad, someone you trust, and, and someone more importantly that trusts you because really they have more to lose than you do. Okay, you, they add you as an authorized user to their account, so therefore now that account will appear on your credit report. And as long, and usually when it's your parents, they have much higher credit limits. They have much longer credit histories. So now that gives you the benefit of that much longer credit history, that much larger credit line. And you, and even tell them, they don't even have to give you the card if they don't really trust you like that, because let's just be real. We know how some parents are. My mom did that to me. She added me to her American Express card when I was young. I didn't even know it. And I never got the card. So that's, that, that was sad. But it helped my credit, because I'm a shopper. Remember, she knew that. But it helped my credit. Yep. So in addition to utilization and establishing the credit, um, if you do, you know, on campus and they give you those credit cards, just making sure that you're being responsible um, on time payments, um, making sure that, like she said, you don't go over the limits and that you're not, you know, getting bad marks or derogatory marks on, on your credit because it's a long term strategy. So you just build one block at a time. And um, just keep that at the forefront of your mind, because sometimes, you know, credit is like one of those things that you use it and forget it. And you're like, oh, well, you know, it's not real money, but it really is real. It will come back to bite you. Um, and, you know, some of us have stories about, man, I wish I didn't take that card on campus um, and go to Linux Mall with it. So <laughs> that's uh, that's happened to some of the best of us. Um, you, Tamika, you mentioned something a few minutes ago in an earlier question. You threw out the term over leveraged. I'd love for you to define what over leveraged means, please. So typically, when it comes to businesses especially, we like to see that you have equal skin in the game, because I know in this case we're talking about in the business space. So we like to see that you have equal skin in the game. So we like to see how much of your business is funded by your own assets, how much of it is funded by debt. So therefore, there's equity financing and debt financing, right? Equity means how much you've injected or you have some investors inject. Debt financing is when you actually get loans from banks. And that's where it can be a great tool. But if you have 40% of your financing or let's say, let's say, 70% of the way your business is funded is all loans, and then maybe only 30% is equity, that can be a hard thing for you to have because, A, it's going to be hard for you to get additional loans because they feel, well, it's getting repaid. You already have other debts out there. And how much of those debts are you using to generate revenue? Is it just debt or is that debt reasonable debt? For instance, have you purchased equipment to expand your productivity so that you can now have, you're a manufacturer, you can now produce more. Well, that makes sense. Your revenue is going to be a reflection of that. But we need to see how much debt you have versus how much income you have and how much money you put into the business yourself. And that's the main thing we want to see. So you don't enter debt frivolously. You want to make sure that it's a wise decision, that you've thought it through, and that it's something that is, um, is truly needed. If I have a credit card that's $1,000, we know that I need to use it in order to build credit, but I don't want it to count against me. So if I have a credit card that has a balance of a thousand dollars, a limit of a thousand dollars, how much should someone be using? I would say um, staying around that thirty to forty percent range is, you know, a good utilization number. Um, once you kind of start getting over 50%, it starts to, starts to count against you. So, you know, keeping that balance, using it, but like she said, using it responsibly. Uh, so on $1,000, three, 300, 350, that's a good good range to stay around. Okay. okay. And I can just add one thing to that real quick, yeah. Erica. It's And she's 100% correct. I agree with her. Um, the only thing I'll add is when it's a business card, the cool part about that is that utilization does not appear on your personal credit. Typically, if you apply for a business credit card and they are not, you still may be a guarantor, which I know she's going to go into that too, but if that business credit card does not appear on your personal credit, that's a good thing because now you're not being penalized by those balances and the utilization will impact you either way. But the business, yes, she's absolutely right. We are going to look at that to see what those balances are compared to the credit limit. So you brought up a good point business credit and that's one of the questions that we get all the time okay i'm a, a new business owner my business is 
maybe 12 to 18 months old, do you think, will I be able to get business credit? Would you issue me a business credit card as a young business owner? I would say for, sorry, Tamika. Yes, that is a possibility. Um, I do a lot of, of secure credit cards. Now, it's not the most attractive thing because people are like, if I need, if I had the money, then I don't need your money. <laughs> but it's an opportunity for you to build the relationship first and foremost, and then also the his history um, that you will need to kind of go to that next step of an unsecured card. So a secured card is when you put up just say, for instance, it's a thousand dollars. You may um, open a CD for eleven hundred dollars or a savings account um, for eleven hundred dollars, and we would hold that as collateral for your credit card. To me, it's one of those where you can kind of have your cake and eat it too, because you have eleven hundred dollars. It's yours. It's not mine. Um, I only kind of come in. The CTB only kind of comes into play if you don't do what you're supposed to do as far as paying the money back. So it's almost like a savings account that you have with eleven hundred dollars in it, but it's still an opportunity for you to have a thousand dollar credit card to use your business expenses and pay back over time. And then once you decide that you, you know, don't want the secure credit card anymore, you can, you know, make sure your balance is at zero and then you have your CD or your savings account still there available for you. And just to piggyback on what she said, um, I agree 100% secure credit cards are great. Credit is, it's really a privilege. It's not a, a right. I think people think that they're supposed to automatically just, you know, I, I have a clean slate so I automatically have good credit. It doesn't work that way. You have to earn that status of good credit. That's why it's a long-term goal and you are to be commended for even sitting here in this forum to learn about these things so that you can build that long-term strategy like we talked about. For startup businesses, we can actually issue you a credit card even if it's brand new and I'll tell you, um, a true story, we have a client who started a business, literally just launched the business. I mean, the ink's still wet, literally, theoretically, on, on the proverbial uh, Secretary of State documents, right? But that's all online now anyway. But they applied for their, their uh, LLC, started their business, but here's, they got a credit card, business credit card with a $10,000 limit. Now, they weren't, a student, they weren't a student, they were a student actually, but an adult, uh, a non-traditional adult student. And the key was not so much even their status as a student, not so much their status um, as a new business. The key was the, the income and the credit. Cash flow is going to be, a, a cash flow and credit, I think, are the two most important things you will need when it comes to establishing credit. They're not gonna, we're not going to punish you because you're a student. We're not going to punish you because your business is new. Credit cards for us is a whole different underwriting path. And it's a lot easier. We don't need financials. We don't need documents. You can even give us projected income. So with cash flow, even though you're thinking, well, wait a minute, you just said cash flow, but yet you're telling me you can give me forecasted income for the business. Yeah, especially if it's a new business, but we're looking at your personal income. So therefore, if you have a day job, you have another business that's generating revenue, you have rental property, you have dividends or some other type of source of income that's consistent that's coming. It can even be public assistance income. We don't judge based on the source of the income. As long as it's consistent income that's coming in and it shows that you can service that debt plus the new debt you'd be assuming, you can get it. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You um, threw a couple of terms out there, so I want to go ahead and piggyback on that. You were talking about cash flow. Um, we were talking about cash flow and credit, which are two of the five C's of credit. I would love if you ladies, maybe we can just take a moment to kind of go through those five C's of credit. So collateral is another one, um, making sure that you have almost something to put up. That's kind of a term that my dad uses when he thinks about collateral. You put something up, we hold that to say, okay, if our initial way that we're going to handle this business, which is you, we've given you this loan, we extended you this credit, and each month you're going to make payments on it. If that falls through, then we could liquidate this collateral. So that could be anything from cash, which like I mentioned for cash to cure credit card, um, you know, slow risk there to um, equipment or real estate, a marketable securities, different things like that, that you could use as your collateral. Um, in addition to that, we have conditions of the market. So that's kind of like, like for instance, earlier Tamika mentioned, it's a COVID world now. So that is, you know, it's changed how we do business. That's something different um, that we 
that the market has changed. And then the fifth one is character is when you do what you say you're going to do. It's like in real life, it's character. When you you pay your bills on time, you um, an indication of character sometimes is your credit score because that's a tracking um, of but how often or how you pay your bills, the frequency and the different trade lines that you have. Um, so character for us is sometimes folks have the ability to repay, but they don't have strong character because they don't go through with those payments, making those payments each month. So that's the, the fifth one. Anything you want to add, Tamika? Yeah, and the only thing I'll add to the character piece is as it relates to um, depending on what you're borrowing, sometimes don't think that banks don't check social media. And you may think, but I'm applying for a loan. What does that have to do with things? You, if you're applying for a business and you have a business website and you have business, you have a business IG, you have, you may use TikTok, you may use all these other different portals. We actually will, will look at that potentially, especially if you're a new business, because we, it's a risk that the bank is assuming. So part of your character is your reputation online. Don't negate that. So, and your reputation not only as a business owner, but we might even look personally. I'm just, and I'm just telling you kind of like the side, they may not even tell you that that happens, but I'm letting you know it does. So what I would tell you, if you have yellow friends, which we all have yellow friends, we all have the crazy friends, put your, your personal profile on private. So that way people can't see it because when you're a business owner, and especially when you're guaranteeing it, it's all open for, for, for a review and for assessment. That's part of your character. That's what we look at. So that's the other piece I would add to that. She talked about condition which is the market conditions. And it also depends not only on COVID, but it depends on the industries themselves. Like look at Redbox, right? Remember Redbox and, and the DVDs? I don't even, I think there's still a few around. I think I've seen a couple. Um, at Walgreens, but they're, they tend to be at the grocery store and Walmart and Walgreens. Yep, but imagine if you were starting a business where you wanted to you wanted to have a few kiosks and Redboxes. Well, there are a few around, but think about it. Where has everybody drifted to? The streaming. So that's something that even though the market, people are, they're home now. You think they can all watch TV. Yeah, but they're not, they may not be watching DVDs. I, my DVD player hasn't worked in I don't know how long. <laughs> so I stream and that's what everybody does, right? So it's, that's part of the condition piece as well. Um, she talked about capacity. The other piece I'll mention as it relates to capital is one of the things the bank will ask you for is a personal financial statement. Here's another tip that you may not know and they will not tell you that they're looking for. Um, we not only look at your cash flow, we like to see your list of assets. Your assets tell us how you've been managing your money. Kind of like when you go to the doctor and they can do your blood work and you can say you work out and you do all this stuff and you eat right, but when they pull that blood work and they can see maybe other levels that tell them you're not, your sugar is high, your cholesterol is high, um, it's the same thing with your personal financial statement. You may make a sizable amount of money doing something, but if you have nothing to show for it in your business. There are no assets, there's no growth. Personally, you have no, you don't own a home, you don't have any investments, you don't have any stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you have no vehicle, you have no assets, then it makes the bank question, your, your, how responsible are you in handling money? How do you spend it? Are you living outside of your means? Are you living a lavish lifestyle that may not be conducive to the business you're trying to support? That's, and we're also looking for types of collateral we could use as well. So don't think it's a huge judgment thing. It's really not, but we, we, it lets us know how responsible of a borrower you would be. And I'm glad you, you teed that up. You could tell we've been doing this for a couple of years. Um, with collateral, that's often one of the areas where college students struggle the most because they're living in the home that their parents own. You know, what advice would you have for a college student that doesn't have collateral? How can they mitigate that risk? How can they overcome that particular hurdle, which happens to be one of the top reasons why most people get declined for loans? One of the things I'll say about that, and I know, Monica, you may have something to add to. I welcome your feedback as well, is SBA lending doesn't require, and that actually helps when there's startups and there are no collateral, right? So SBA lending can definitely be a tool and a resource to use in that case. Um, that's one thing. Secondly, it may be an issue of buying a home actually is now easier than it's ever been. And again, we're talking long-term goals, right? So what's the priority? Is the priority, because you need a place, well, if you're a student living on campus, that's not a factor. But if you're living off campus and you, 
it depends on your circumstances. Buying a home, the down payment requirement is not as high as it used to, as you think it is. In some cases, it can be three and a half percent. In some cases, depending on the area, it can be a hundred percent. Meaning you have to, there's no down payment necessary, and there's down payment assistance, so you can actually own a home. It's easier than you think. Interest rates right now are in the two to three percent ranges. They're the lowest I've ever seen them. So if that's an option for you, then great. But it may not be for all students. So SBA, I would recommend would be the route to go when you don't have collateral. That's the, the best lending option when collateral shortfalls exist. You can go to SBA directly to borrow, but you have to still go through a preferred SBA lender, which I know we are one, and I'm sure CTB also is an SBA lender. Um, you would have to still come through us, which is why the relationship is going to be critical, and I know you're going to touch on that too. Absolutely. Do you have anything else to add, Monica, about collateral? Sure. So, um, yep, in addition to credit enhancements like SBA, there are other programs out there. We often work with the uh, state small business initiative, uh, credit initiative. We call it SSBCI, I think it's the acronym. And it's just like SBA, they offer a guarantee to help with some of those um, shortfalls in collateral or down payment or the equity. Um, so those are some options. And then you could also add a co-borrower. So, you know, if you're living at home with your parents and they want to put their house up for you because they believe in your dream that much, then that's an option too. And one other thing I'll add to that, which someone told me that I didn't realize that it was something that people didn't know. When you're buying equipment for your business, that actually is the collateral. The very thing you're purchasing is the collateral. So it's not like you have to own something already. The thing you're buying could be the collateral. So know that that's an option as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I want to shift a little bit to one of the areas that I get the most questions here at the incubator, the business plan. Of course, things, entrepreneurship continues to pivot and things in business continue to happen faster, quicker. You know, you need instant stuff. So whereas the business plan used to be the staple document in the industry, now people are pivoting towards the business model canvas, which is the shorter, the more condensed version. So I'd love to hear your opinion on a what role does a plan of some sort play with your institution, and do you accept the business model canvas, or does someone have to give you a business a business plan? So at CTB, um, I haven't received very many um, business model canvases um, for startups. They do oftentimes have a business plan and we will accept it. We like to take a look at that and kind of understand what your plans for your business is. But the key words there is this is your plan for your business. So it's good for you to have a plan, a detailed, um, thorough plan for your business because it sort of operates as a roadmap, if you will, for what your goals are, what your, you know, the different targets that you want to hit for your business, identifying your audience and different things like that, which I'm sure everybody on the call already understands. But the only point that I will make sure I reiterate is it's your plan for your business. And then if there, if that's a, a mechanism or tool that you can use to help me, an outsider, um, understand your plan better. I mean, if the if the model canvas does that, then that, that's fine too. Um, but it, it, it helps to have documentation that you can, you know, concise and quickly summarize what you're planning for your business is for me because I don't know you know very much about the other person's business or the plan or any of those things. Ms. Stafford? To echo her words, I agree. I agree 100% with what she said. Um, I too have not seen very many business model canvases or canvas models, but it's the point is that what the information that's there in. People spend a lot of money on these fancy business plans and it's not even necessary. All we care about is exactly what are you trying to do? How are you going to get it done? Have you done your research? Do you know your competition? Do you know exactly your, your, your SWOT analysis? We need to see that. And that, that model would allow us to see all that at a glance. But more importantly, it shows us that you know and you've done your homework with it and you've discussed or assessed how you're going to pay us back. And before we jump into the questions, and there's a couple here, the magic, the magic topic that always comes up in every, every uh discussion that's not on paper, but we know plays a significant role, the relationship. Tamika alluded to it in the beginning. Um, we, I know relationships make the world go round. The, many of the participants on the call may have heard that, that their parents have told them, build strong relationships, have a good relationship. But from the lender's point of view, 
Tamika, can you elaborate on, I'll, I'll tee Tamika up first just because she brought up the topic. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what you meant when you were talking about the relationship piece of it? Absolutely. When you deal with your banker before you even need money, that is crucial because they already know who you are and they can kind of guide you. You'll learn exactly what they're looking for. It'll save you time. It'll save you money. For instance, people run out to get DMV paydex scores and they'll run out and get all these other things perfected when we don't even look at that. We don't look at your Dun & Bradstreet. We don't look at your paydex score. We only look at Equifax. Having that relationship, though, you already know that going in because you've communicated with each other. You you mentioned it's not like dating, but to me it kind of is because you think about folks that you know. Like if if we know each other, who are you more likely to let borrow money? Somebody that you know or a stranger? So you, you know the obvious answer there is somebody that you know that you've built a relationship with, that you kind of know their character. You know, um, you have an idea at least about um, what they do and how they handle their business. So you may, like to your point, go out, not go out on a full limb, but you may, you know, try to give them advice or counsel that you may, may not give it to a stranger or just try to do something take an exception that you may not normally take just because you know that this person is good for it or that they have high integrity. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, for your energy, your experience. Um, we really appreciate you. Again, this is one of the more popular and helpful workshops that we do every year, and I enjoy having you.